So we'll transition to our talk, uh, May 18th, NFTs, Fad or Leaning Trend by Cynthia Kirkby. She's the founder of Imprint AdTech, WizWits, and Covert Inc. In the past year, NFTs have definitely moved into a, a lot of the news segments that we've been seeing. Um, you know, we've, been, we've definitely been seeing a big increasing dollar amount. We saw the Beeple auction for, from Christie's auction for $69 million. Um, we saw an, another collection uh, uh, sold for over $100 million. But Cynthia is going to walk us through this, what this means, what are NFTs, are they a fad or a lean trend, how are they being used, and what does the future hold for them? So a really insightful talk. Um, so take it away, Cynthia. Thank you very much. I'm unable to start my video. It seems you've turned off my video. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> OK, so. Hello, everybody. Um, OK, so thank you for coming, first of all. Um, the NFT area is a really interesting one. I, I started doing a deep dive on it last year when a friend of mine contacted me about it. And uh, so I thought I'd give kind of an overview of what's happening in this area. So when you take a look at migration onto the digital realm, you know, this is kind of a quick rundown of, of kind of major <laughs> shifts that took place. So Wikipedia, you know, took the encyclopedia virtual, then we had Spotify taking music over, Netflix taking, um, you know, movies. And then um, the, the part that starts affecting the NFTs is Ethereum created smart contracts in 2015. And then in 2017, crypto uh, punks came along and it was the first generative um, NFT collection. So there were 10,000 of them. Uh, they were actually weren't on a smart contract. Um, they were pre-smart contract um, as far as NFTs went. Um, but um, the, the structure of what they put together is, has been kind of the basis that most people think of as NFTs now. So it's not a fad. Um, when you take a look at, at the transitions of things, the smart contracts, which are authentications, allow the transition of the art world and the collectible world into the virtual world. And so we're seeing all the, all the um, art fields, you know, music and, and regular art, uh, converting over into the virtual arena, which is what a lot of people are talking about when they talk about Web3. Um, there's also an enormous shift over with gaming as well. Now, this was um, a slide that was part of a, a big report that CB Insights did, which is a phenomenal uh, analytics company. And you can see there was like no, no, nothing going on in this realm um, up until last year. And in 2021, it exploded. So um, in third quarter, to give you an idea of last year, they were at half this volume. So they were at uh, $2 billion. And then uh, by the end of the year, the last quarter added another $2 billion to the investment that started taking place just related to NFTs. This wasn't even blockchain. This is just NFT infrastructure um, companies. And at the beginning of this year, just one deal, which was for um, what they call BAYC, um, which is um, Board Ape Yacht Club, they've created like a studio. It was a $450 million deal, just one of them. So just a, <laughs> that one deal has like eclipsed everything. And in the first few months of this year, there have been multiple $100 million deals um, that have taken place. So this year is going to smash all of these records as well. So it's definitely, there's an enormous amount of moving going on in this area as far as infrastructure and build up. It's definitely like it was in the 90s when the inter internet first, you know, really started getting uh, traction. And uh, so I'm going to give you a little background first. So what's a token? A token is just a record of ownership of an asset. And when you take a look at what most people think of as tokens, it's like Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, it's actually fungible. So um, it's tradable. And then when you go to what an NFT is, it's what they call a non-fungible token. So it's a unique identifier that's registered on the blockchain and it, it's a certification. So it's not really art, <laughs> it's the certification of the art or the certification of the music. 
and um, everybody wants to know what fungibility is. <laughs> so fungibility is the ability to exchange something. So with uh, dollar bills are the easiest thing. So you have a dollar bill, looks like another dollar bill, you can exchange them. And um, so that's fungibility. Now, NFTs are normally non-fungible because each NFT is a unique piece of, of artwork. So this is the Pudgy Penguin collection part of it. There's 8,888 of them. Each one is a unique image. And so because they're different, you can't easily exchange them. They're not equal value. They have different prices. Um, now NFTs actually include some fungibility because they're including now uh, limited editions and what they call open editions or game tokens um, as NFTs, even though they're not actually non-fungible anymore. So there's a little bit of a, of a blurring of the lines on fungibility on these. So <clears throat> why have artists adopted them? Um, artists started figuring it out really quick that this that these smart contracts were really cool because in California in 1977, there was a, a thing called the Resale Royalty Act. And what that said was that if I sold a piece of artwork, um, if it was resold, I was supposed to receive 10% of that resale value back to me. Um, it was struck down by the courts because there wasn't any trackability of the fact that the artist had triggered this royalty act. And they said, you can't hold somebody to a contract if they don't know about it, which made sense. Um, but what has happened with the NFTs is the smart contracts, because it's all visible and, and um, transparent, is whoever is buying the piece of artwork on a smart contract, if there's an artist royalty, it's visible. And so um, most of the NFTs have an artist royalty built into them. And it might be anywhere from a percent up to 10%. There are a few that have gone over that, but a lot of the, the marketplaces actually have a cap at 10%. But the, the benefits for uh, the smart contracts on the NFTs is that you have authentication, you have a provenance, which obviously in the art world has always been an issue. Um, like I just mentioned, there's transparency in the sales contracts. And that artist royalty really adds up when the prices start going up like they have in this area. So there's a number of different types of NFT editions. You have originals like in the regular art world, which are one of ones. Um, generative collections, which are what most people hear about, which is like the Pudgy Penguin collection I just showed you. Um, those are created by an artist creating layers and then an algorithm. And I'll get into that more. Uh, limited editions, classic, you know, typical thing of you selling more than one copy of an issue. And then an, a thing that's completely unique on the internet, which is called an open edition, which is the, um, the amount of images sold in a particular limited edition is um, controlled by the amount of time that it's up for sale. So they may do a um, one hour um, opening for the collection if it's a very popular artist, or they may put it up for 24 hours or a week, whatever it happens to be. But however many sell during that time, as soon as that time period is, ends, the collection's closed. And then you have another thing called commons, which are basically like posters. Um, you mostly see those in the gaming community. Um, this open edition was by a guy named Beeple, and um, it was the first one that actually came with a mailed piece of art and a video and stuff that came in the mail, as well as um, purchasing the, the limited edition NFT. Um, and there's also a thing called utility NFTs. And the NFTs are used to do something. So um, it may give you an access to a, a live event that you might be going to. Um, it may give you access to a club or to a poker. This is, this is uh, for a poker club. So you, in order to get into the games online, you have to have one of their NFTs. So it acts like a gate. Um, and then, you know, now they're being used even to certify property and university degrees, all sorts of things. It's really interesting. So all of these are made possible because of Ethereum smart contracts. 
And uh, now the smart contracts are on a lot of different blockchains. Um, the most common ones you probably heard of are like Solana and um, Ethereum. You've got some other smaller ones, but there's a, a ton of them now. There's Wax for gaming. Um, so a smart contract is, is a coded contract that doesn't require a person to execute the contract. Um, it self-executes. So you put all the terms in and then you know a buyer comes to buy something. The, um, if there's a royalty, the royalty is taken out immediately and put into the artist's wallet. You don't have to have a person say, oh, I'm gonna send you that royalty. It's all done automatically on the internet. Um, and so the, the code and the agreement all exists on the blockchain and everything's traceable. Um, so they're, they're really, a, uh, it was a very interesting um, innovation. So there's three primary types of contracts that come into play with NFTs. Um, the, ERC, the ERC, which stands for Ethereum, the ERC-20s um, are mostly fungible tokens. So that would be the Ethereums. Um, you might've heard of Cardano or Solana. Um, those are all those coins. Bitcoin is a, is a, a token. And then the ERC-721, um, and if you're on Solana, it would become a SOL-721. Um, those are one-of-a-kind tokens. So those are those unique um, items. Now, because people started doing limited editions, some of the limited editions are still coming out under the 721s, which is a little strange, but most of them are coming out under the 1155, which was kind of taking the best world of both the, the 20s and the 721s, they put the contracts together and then tweaked them. And so what it lets you do is it lets you use it as a utility. Um, so you can have it do certain types of things like let you into an area, but it also certifies the piece of art or music or whatever it happens to be certifying. So a lot of news has been out there about the uh, energy problem related to NFTs and how horrible it is. Um, but the reality is that most of the NFTs are no longer on um, what they call proof of work blockchains. So Ethereum is, is, was the first one that everybody started putting NFTs up on. And the problem with Ethereum is that it's a proof of work. Um, so the requirements are very high on the energy consumption. Most of the blockchains now are on what they call proof of stake, and um, those require almost no energy. So I'll, I'll explain what these both are. So on a proof of work, you've got miners out there and you've probably heard of people mining Bitcoin. Um, the miners are programmers. Um, well, they're, they're guys that have computers <laughs> that are solving complicated problems that are um, done out of, um, cryptography. And so in order to make the next data block, you have to solve the puzzle and then they let you create that. I'm not sure where they stop. Okay. Uh, so when the next data block gets created, that person who made it gets a reward. Now, obviously you're, you're kind of in this pool of millions of people that are trying to um, mine and, and solve these puzzles. But the probability of you being chosen to, of you solving the puzzle first is going to, in a, is going to result in whether or not you have a lot of com computing power. The more computing power you have, the more your probability goes up. Um, malicious code on blockchains is very, very difficult because you literally need 51% of the computing power on one that's proof of work in order to be able to put a malicious block in. And uh, that's not very likely. <laughs> now, proof of stake is different fundamentally because instead of solving these puzzles, you're staking your coins. So if you have Ethereum, you're taking part of your Ethereum and you're saying, I'm gonna let you hold on to my Ethereum so that I can have a chance of um, making the next data block. And so there's an, a math algorithm that goes through and randomly picks somebody that is staking their coins. Now, instead of having the probability increase by computing power, 
the probability increases with how many of the, your tokens that you've staked. Um, and again, malicious block would require 51% of all the tokens on that particular blockchain. So if you're on a little blockchain, which there are some very small ones, you have more of a possibility of malicious codes um, blocks because they're not necessarily robust enough. But most of the blockchains that are coming out are putting out literally millions of um, tokens so that there isn't that issue. Now, the other thing you may have heard about is a DAO. And the DAO is um, a decentralized control of a group. And they're happening a lot with NFTs because the people that are making the NFTs are building out companies around them. And so instead of having all of the control to one, one person that owns the company, they're allowing the group that has invested in the collection to have some say in what they do next. And so sometimes it's determining which, what kind of next collection they're gonna make. It may be giving them access to a private space. It may be something where they're choosing the charity that a percentage of the collection money is going toward. Um, but once, once a DAO is deployed on the blockchain, you have to have all the members agree to make any changes to it. Um, well, at least the majority of them. Um, so um, it's a it's a interesting consensus group. So because the the type of NFTs that are mostly in the news are what we call generative collections, they're also called um, profile pictures, and this is kind of typical of what you've seen um, probably in the news. So you've got you know this image here, and there's all these different permutations of it. This one is called Wow World of Women. Um, and it, they actually did a thing with the UN on their launch. Um, and Doge Pound is another one. So, um, but these are all on the 721 collection groups. And this is how they're created. So this is, this is one that I've been working on. It's, um, it's a secret agent and the secret agent's a cat. So he's agent R, but what you have are all these different um, groupings that are groups of layers that I've built up. And there are someplace between 100 and 200 layers within these groups, um, depending on the type of collection. And then what happens with the algorithm is you set rarity levels, percentages that affect your layers. And then the algorithm picks one layer out of each of the groups and mixes and matches them. And so there are no duplicates. Um, the algorithm is structured so that it eliminates any duplicates. But if you get something that has a rarity, like a 1%, then the price of that NFT goes up. If it's something that's not rare, like this one that's at 80%, that's way more common, it's gonna be less, less likely to have any value. Um, and so they may be something fairly simple, like the one on the left, or there may be a much more complicated look where, where there's getting more, um, more of the active layers picked from um, complicated groupings. And so um, these kinds of sets are usually anywhere from 100, which is unusual, to 10,000, which is actually fairly common. Um, but they take quite a bit of work. Um, this is Board Ape Yacht Club. This one um, image by their collection sold for $2.7 million. Both his skin color and the, the glasses and the crown were all rare. Um, and so it's one of the most expensive ones in their collection. <clears throat> so the, there's an interesting crossover with AI happening in art and NFTs. And um, so in addition to the type of generative art that I just showed you, there's a different kind of generative art, which is actually art that's created completely from code. And um, this particular type of generative art, there's a marketplace that specializes just in this type of art. Um, these four images are all from the same collection. Um, by a guy named Tyler Hobbs, and he calls it uh, Fidenza. And um, 
his art has more of a look of a classic abstract art from like maybe the 60s and 70s. And um, he's very, very popular. Um, I was looking up statistics this last week and he sold over $150 million worth of NFTs at this point. That includes the resales. So when somebody buys something, then they will resell it and increase the price a lot of times. About 60% of NFTs are resold and about 40% are held long-term. Um, he just did a new collection, um, I think about a month ago. It was called Incomplete Control. And um, the NFTs in that collection sold for over $20 million. And those are all original sales. That does not include any resales yet. So anytime that something resells, he gets, um, I think he's got his set at either five or 10% on the, on the royalty. So 10% of that sale on the resale would go to the artist. Um, so there's, um, there's another type of um, computer AI art, which is called a style transfer. And this is an original photograph I took of a wood deck. And it, it actually really isn't a spectacular photograph. It's a little blurry. Um, but then I created this pattern and I applied it with um, AI style transfer. And this is what came out of it, which I think is really pretty cool. And as you can see, it's not like it's just overlaid onto the image. It's actually looking at the image and then taking parts of those that pattern and applying it. And so it's not always predictable. There are times when I'll tweak patterns over and over and over again, trying to get them to lay in a certain way. Um, but the outcome is, is usually pretty interesting. So you have both a, a content image, which is the duck, and then you have the style reference. And then it takes a look at both of those and you can actually control how much of the content image is being affected by the style reference image. And so there's a lot of tweaking that goes on. <laughs> it's kind of like cooking. Uh, you, you can adjust the ingredients um, and it, it comes out different every time. So another type of AI art that's being used in NFTs is what they call a GANs. And that's a, as it says on my slide here, it's, it's a generative adversarial network. So what you have is you have a generator that's trying to create an image and you have a discriminator that's taking a look at all the other images within the sample sets and saying, you're close or not close enough. And then the generator goes back and tries again. And so these are iterative. So when you're trying to do these types of, um, this type of artwork, you're creating something from, sometimes from absolutely nothing. There's a, there's a text to image uh, generator where you're describing something and then the, the um, generator is trying to figure out how to make it look like what you're describing, which is pretty interesting. This is a particular GAN, which is called um, Big GAN and, and it's been also applied with style GANs. And it's kind of the combination of biology art and programming. So um, the picture down here is a sketch that I had done and then tweaked in another program. And then I crossed it with this image, which was a made up person that was in the program that I use. And this is what came out of it after I tweaked it a few times. And then I took that and I put it into a different part of the program where I can actually adjust what they call the genes of the image. And so every time I adjust one of these factors here, she changes. And so when I tweaked her in that, this is what came out. So I went from this image to this image and it's, it's very little tiny changes can change the image remarkably. And sometimes a small change in something that you wouldn't think would affect the image very much changes some other characteristic. So the genes are sometimes related so if I change like the blue, it might also change the look of her um, uh, background from where she comes from. Um, so it's, it's very interesting how this particular um, adversarial network works. 
Um, this is another type, which is called VQGAN, and it uses a secondary um, programming called CLIP. And this is text to image. So these were created with me describing something, and then it creates um, an image. And every time I run it, it learns more. And on these ones, these were um, images that I created that I referenced the Book of Kells. And so that's why it has an illuminated manuscript look. And um, so I've been tweaking images along these lines. And I had actually put in um, a specification that there was an illuminated rabbit in the right hand one and a bird on the left hand one. I think I actually said it was a hummingbird. And so you can see where it starts trying to generate the look of that um, animal within the illuminated style of the Book of Kells. Um, but I'll tweak all sorts of references and then sometimes I'll throw them into Photoshop and work on them further in there. <clears throat> this is another type of the VQGAN, but then I've added a third thing, which is the style transfer again. And so the one on the left was created completely from scratch. The one on the in the middle, I applied one type of style transfer to from a pattern that I had created. And then I created like a beaded pattern and I applied that to the middle image and the one on the right is what came out of it. So you can see the transition of it getting somewhat more complex, but I think way more cool. Um, so as you adjust these different AI art programs and work with them, um, remarkable things come out. So um, to give you an idea of what's taking place out there, this is CryptoPunks. It's considered the first um, uh, NFT collection that was generative. So there were 10,000 in the set. They're one of one, which means that they're unique. Every single one is different. Um, they originally were not sold. <laughs> they were given away and they're little 16 by 16 pixels. And the most expensive one is number 300, uh, 3,100 out of the uh, 10,000. And it recently sold for 7.58 million. Now, the reason it's selling for so much is because this was the first collection. Um, it's not saying that, you know, a 16 by 16 pixel image is spectacular art, but it's the first type of this art that was ever created. So that's why it goes for so much money. Um, Beeple is um, a very interesting guy. This collection was called um, uh, the first, first five, it was Beeple's Everydays. And he created a new piece of computer art every day for 16 years. And he would put them up on his website. And when NFT started happening, he decided to make a collage out of them all. Um, and Christie's auction house actually put it up for sale and it sold for $69 million. And so um, each one of these pieces of artwork within the collage can actually be enlarged and looked at. Um, but, oh, I guess it was 13 years, not 16. But the, uh, it, it was a total of 5,000 days that he created a piece of art every single day and didn't miss any, which is pretty remarkable. Um, now this is a thing called uh, Human One, which he created after he made all that money. Um, it's the first of its kind. It's a video sculpture and it has a dynamic NFT that goes with it. So there's an NFT that you could show on your TV at home. Um, and then this is actually a physical sculpture that was in a museum for a while, but this is what it looks like. And so it rotates, but it keeps the orientation of the four screens that are around the cube so that you look like you're looking into another world. Um, it's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Um, and, uh, and this sold for almost $30 million. So let me stop this so I can switch. Oop, I seem to be stuck. There we go. And then um, Board Ape Yacht Club was created by a group called Yugo Labs. And um, they did very, very well. They're, they're funky. I, I guess you have to 
find something that appeals to you. These particular um, NFTs, when you owned one of them, it gave you access into their yacht club online. And um, so it acted like a key into a website. And the, the main highlight of this website was you could go in and draw graffiti inside um, the bathroom <laughs> of, the, of the yacht club. And it was actually based on an old code from the 1990s, which I knew from way back, which was for the million dollar website, which was you could buy one pixel for $1 on that particular website. And it, you could color it. So the more pixels you bought, the more you could draw graffiti on, on the page. And people were making their logos and, and all sorts of weird things on that. Um, but that guy sold out all of the pixels on his page, which made him a million dollars back then. So they took that old, old code and put it into their website. Um, but they recently, they're the ones that raised the $450 million at the beginning of this year. Um, and now their company is worth $4 billion. So that they bought part of the collection of the, of the CryptoPunks. They bought a secondary one that was made by the same group, which is Lar uh, Larva Labs, which was uh, Mebits. And then they, they put their own collections into it and they did a big raise with a bunch of investors. And now they're building out an entire, like um, what they consider metaverse area where people can come in and interact. <laughs> this is <laughs> very interesting artwork by a young man. When he started doing these, he was 17. This particular one, um, he sold five copies of this image. And it, it's kind of weird because it, as an NFT, it breathes. <laughs> is pretty weird um but he's become incredibly popular um this recently sold for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. um originally it was sold for five thousand and um he's only 19 years old right now and he's sold someplace in the vicinity of 40 million dollars worth of art um so he's a happy camper so oops let's close that off and go down so again, this is Fidenza uh, that I showed you earlier. And uh, this particular one is a very popular one and it sold for 3.3 million. But, um, but he's, he's done a lot of really, all of his work has this kind of um, same thematic look. It's usually uh, color blocks of some sort that are strung together within his algorithm, but he's worked for five years on the algorithm. So it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, this is within the, um, the sports arena. Um, NBA was the first one that came out with an NFT related to um, the NBA stuff. It comes out as a cube and there's different images on the cube. And then there's actually a small film clip of a particular game. And so these have been incredibly popular. Um, hundreds of million dollars have already been spent on these things. So, um, but this is a, a, a little collection. I'm not sure how they've actually done. I haven't seen much in the way of resales on this, but the thing that was really interesting about this was they're really the first ones that I knew of that was trying to um, connect a physical style NFT with a online image NFT. So these, these uh, toys down here are actually done in components so that if you get an NFT that has a purple head and um, a green arm, um, they actually assemble it and send it to the person. And it's tied to the online image with an embedded NFC chip. So, um, but the problem is that people haven't really figured out how to necessarily uh, make sure that when you sell an NFT that has a physical object, how they're going to transfer the physical object. So there hasn't been much in the way of resells on these. And this is one of the more recent um, unusual things that have come out. This was called Merge. In a way, it's kind of boring, but the, the concept behind it is very interesting. Um, what you did on this one was you were buying a thing that he called mass. And it, literally functions like mass. And what happened was 
the more that you bought, the bigger your dot got. <laughs> and people went crazy over this thing. They had, uh, I think, 38,000 people buying these, trying to get a larger and larger mass as their NFT. But what the way that it worked was when you bought one and then you added a second one to it, it grew. One of them would get burned off so that that secondary NFT no longer existed. So it basically merged the two NFTs into one and it couldn't be separated once it was merged. And so um, there are a number of transformative NFTs coming out that are really a fascinating area for me um, where something may change over time. And the first people that started doing it with the gamers. So you might have like kind of like a Pokemon card. Um, so if you ever had kids that had Pokemons, um, you have three generations of a particular character. And instead of having three cards in the NFT world, it changes through code. And so you look at your image one day, it looks one way and the next, maybe you sell it twice and then it hits the third generation and you open up that wallet and it looks completely different and you can't roll it back to its earlier form. So um, metamorphic NFTs are a, a very interesting area that you're probably gonna see a lot more of. So what's next? Um, we're only scratching the surface now. This is like the beginning of the internet. And just like when the internet started in the 1990s where you had all kinds of scams, you had companies that were getting funded by people for enormous amounts of money and then blowing up the companies 10 months later, um, there was one that, that came into my space at the time, which was online education. And uh, they got funded $110 million that they blew through in 10 months. I still have no idea how they went through that much money in that small amount of time. Um, but now they're being used for all sorts of things. So some of the things that you may start seeing is virtual keys. So the NFT, you show it when you go into a location, they verify it and you, you're allowed in and it's like an exclusive membership type thing. Um, you're starting to see some of it on change records. So you see it in supply chains with uh, proof of receipts, but you also will see, start seeing them more with wills and contracts where there's a change record. So instead of, if you've done um, anything in the construction industry and there's all the RFIs and then the RFPs and all the contracts that change every time that somebody makes a change in the construction, all of that will start going into a smart contract that may be connected to an NFT. And then there's um, digital cert certifications and there's even now proof of knowledge, which is actually diplomas and educational certificates that are showing up as NFTs. So now um, we're gonna open it up for questions. I know I dumped a lot on you, uh, not too technical, but a lot of information. So um, if you have any questions, I'm open. Uh, we do have a question in chat from Tracy. Can this be applied to items other than art? Other than what? Other, th other than art. Yes, as I was saying, it's being applied in just about every area. Um, it's being used for, a lot of the artists have picked it up, including musicians, um, but it's being used in the gaming community. It's being used in uh, things like poker. I used to be a tournament poker player. Um, and so now to get into some of the poker games, you actually have to buy an NFT, um, but it's being used, it, because it's a certification, it's not actually a specific thing. It's not, a, it's not just art. Um, an NFT is a certification of something. So you might have an NFT that's a, a online book um, that's signed by the artist. So that would be an authentication uh, NFT for a, a first edition signed copy of a book. So yeah, they're being used everywhere. Um, let's see. Uh, another question in the chat was some critics of cryptocurrencies bring up the point that the power consumption is very high. Uh, University of Cambridge estimates upwards of 125 plus terawatts per year globally, which references about the annual energy usage of a country like Norway. So for someone who cares about global warming, 
and greenhouse gases created from such power? How do you reconcile the environmental impact versus the actual value of crypto? Okay, so crypto in general, uh, I'm not a fan of, of Bitcoin because of that. Um, Ethereum is switching over to what they're calling their layer two, which is actually a proof of stake um, uh, structure that I went through earlier. And proof of stake has basically no energy consumption. Um, because it's not running through all those computing, trying to figure out the cryptographic puzzles. Um, so that's why all these other marketplaces and coins have popped up all over the place, um, like so Solana, because they're all on proof of stake. And people have moved away from a lot of the stuff on Ethereum. Or like in some cases, you can use what they call a bridge, which is something like Polygon which allows you to do a, what they call a gasless transaction on Ethereum, which does not, it, it uses a proof of stake bridge to allow you to do a transaction on Ethereum. So there's a lot of slicing and dicing going on to stop the huge energy consumption, but the majority of NFTs are not being done on high, um, high energy anymore. Um. A couple of people asked, what is your background in NFT and how did you get started with NFTs? Um, I started getting involved in them last year because a friend of mine contacted me and wanted to know um, what I knew about them. And at the time, I didn't know too much. Um, so I spent a couple months and did a deep dive research into them and then actually have now created some uh, collections that we're going to be launching related to them. Um, but the, my background is art. Um, I have degrees in art and English. And um, because of the way some of the AI art works that is now being used in NFTs, um, it's kind of a natural fit for me, that in technology. So. Oh, and it looks like somebody actually, I reinterpreted that wrong. Someone's asking if your Zoom background is an NFT itself. Actually it is. It's, it's not an NFT, but it is a AI art that I created. Um, it's a, a text to image AI system and then took it into Photoshop and did some additional work on it in there. Um, somebody in the chat had asked, uh, can a blockchain die or malfunction? What happens to all the assets encoded on that chain? That's a really good question. Um, some of the early blockchain, um, chains that were popping up, different tokens that were popping up um, are no longer in use. I mean, the, the information exists still, it doesn't disappear um, because it's distributed. So it all exists out there still. It's just that nobody is still using it. Um, for the most part, I think there, there's somebody said that there's someplace around 10,000 uh, different blockchains out there right now, but, but the majority of the um, uh, transaction take place on five um, primary um, chains. So, um, but I, I haven't, as far as malfunction, not really a couple have been hacked. And, uh, and so there have been adjustments put into things um, because of the type of, uh, of hacks that have taken place. So, just like anything else, somebody will figure out how to game the system, but it's very, very difficult. Uh, Joe asks, a Filecoin Green is an initiative that's seeking to make its blockchain carbon neutral. Is that possible? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, all of the ones that are uh, proof of stake are pretty much carbon neutral. Um, there is no energy consumption being done because they're not doing any computing. It's, it's one algorithm that picks somebody based on their staking of their coins within the blockchain. And so there's no energy consumption taking place. To give you an idea of what that translates to as far as money goes, if you're doing a transaction on Ethereum uh, one, um, it might be um, what they call a gas fee, which is the consumption fee for uh, the cryptographic uh, solution, might be $200 or more to do a transaction. Whereas on something like uh, Polygon Layer 2 or Solana, it might be uh, three cents or even less than a penny. 
So there's just no consumption of energy taking place. Uh, another question was, uh, people seem to like the idea that smart contracts and anything in the blockchain is transparent. Uh, uh, since smart contract solidity, source code is public, projects like Ethereum, Bitcoin, blockchain are open source on GitHub and makes it attractive because the code is transparent. Can you talk more about this global movement toward transparency? That's, a, that's an interesting one. I think it's, um, you know, there have been so many scandals through the years of things that have taken place um, because there was lack of transparency. You get banks that rip people off, um, like the big scandal that Wells Fargo had a few years ago where they had people opening multiple accounts under people's names so that they were getting additional fees um, from their, uh, their bank users. Um, a lot of, one of the moves is to DeFi finance, which is uh, decentralized finance. And, um, and so, Again, the, the transactions, it's interesting because it, the transparency doesn't necessarily mean that you can um, see everything within the, the um, information that's being shared. Um, it does mean that you can see the transaction. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's different safeguards that are taking place, but on something like say a charity, when I was a kid, Muscular dystrophy had a big scandal with um, uh, one of the guys that was doing fundraising for muscular dystrophy. And it turned out that he was taking a big chunk of the money that he raised every year with the, with the telethon that he ran. And um, with something like uh, going onto the blockchain for, for charitable donations, you can actually see that how much of the money is actually going to the charity. So a lot of the NFT collections um, donate money to a charity. You can see if they do it or not. <laughs> if it doesn't, and, and because they're self-executing contracts, it's not a matter of they have to go in and say, if, if they said that 1% is going to the charity, they don't have to physically go in and take 1% and give it to the charity. There's actually, the charity sets up a wallet and that 1% is taken out automatically when a, when a sale is done. So, I mean, Transparency is good. I like it. Um, the question is, can this be used for proof of unique identity, such as driver's license or social security ID? What would such, would such uses be secure? Well, the, the security on something like that would be interesting. Um, it's definitely being used. Um, people are, they're, the first universities have started using them as diplomas. So um, you can do, um, content that can't be seen by anybody other than the person holding the NFT. Um, it's called unlockable content. And so um, it's, it's cryptographically secure. And if you own it, you can actually see the content, but nobody outside can. So on something like a driver's license, you would be able to show somebody your phone with the ID, and that's the only way they'd be able to see it because they'd be able to see that you had a valid license, but to see maybe the, um, the specific driver's license number or whatever encrypted coding the state wanted to put in, you'd have to be able to actually show them the license um, as an NFT. So there, there, there's a lot of interesting uses to it. Um, how it all spins out as far as, you know, government agencies and stuff, it's, you know, your guess is as good as mine on that one. But, um, but it is an authentication. Um, so, um, and once it's on the blockchain, it's not like you can remove it, it's up there. Uh, another question, uh, where are NFT artworks actually stored? Are they centralized or decentralized? Well, it depends on the collection. There are some uh, collections that people have put just into something like uh, a Google Drive. Um, there's a number of organizations that charge to store um, the collections. Um, and then there's a thing called the IPFS, which is a distributed um, uh, venture that they've done, which is open source. So you can actually upload your images and they, it disassembles the image into code because basically any kind of image that you're showing on a computer can be disassembled into code. So you're uploading the code 
And so it resides in a distributed network on the blockchain. And uh, those are the better collections because somebody, if, you, if you're paying $20 a month to store your collection, what happens in five years when you're not paying attention anymore and you stop paying the $20? I'm not sure what's gonna to happen to some of those images, but if they're stored into the IPFX, the IPFS, then they're not going anywhere. So. Uh, what are the chances of a good painter surviving on an NFT business? Of a what? A surviving on an NFT business. Oh, like somebody telling, that's doing uh, an yes. NFT artist? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are making a good living at it. Um, to, when you take a look at like, if you're doing good art, I mean, there's a lot of real junk out there right now because you know anybody that knows how to program went, oh, I can do one of these. And they're throwing up these collections that are just absolutely awful art. And then they're, they're saying, oh, you know, the NFT boom has ended because nobody's buying my art. No, it's just that it's bad art. Um, you know, the ones that are putting out interesting collections with good art are selling their art and they're not selling for cheap. Um, you know, the average price on, um, on the release of a new uh, generative collection is usually someplace between uh, 80 and $250 a piece. And if you're taking a look at a 10,000 piece collection, that's a lot of bucks. So if, even at $100 a piece, if you sell out that 10,000 collection, that's a million dollars. So yeah, it's, there's a lot of money going around right now. Um, another question is, could the, could the Dow create an investment fund? Has it been done? Yes, there are a number of Dow investment funds. Um, the first one that came out that he, he's not calling himself a, an investment fund, he is calling himself a fund but he's trying to, I think, dodge the SEC, is called Whale. And what he did was he bought some CryptoPunks and some of the other really um, high value uh, NFTs. And he started um, a fund of NFTs that people could buy a token that owned the collection. Um, but he doesn't really have any safeguards or anything in it. There are other ones that are actually real funds that are listed with the, NF the SEC and you can buy into a collection of NFTs that, that a group has assembled. So yeah, it's been done. And there's other slices on uh, funds as well. A lot of different things happening. Uh, another question on that was, so music art and video art together are producing music videos. Music art and NFT together may someday produce music NFT. Um, already out there. Already, <laughs> already been done. <laughs> Yeah, they're already out there. There's uh, music NFTs, there's um, NFTs that are um, a combination of um, sometimes a, a, a animated film with music. Some are a still image with music. Um, pretty much any combination of anything that you can think of is turning into some kind of uh, interesting NFT project. And probably the last question, is the token for the NFT just a web URL that points to a metadata JSON file on the website? I know the metadata file has trait names and another URL to the actual image for the NFT. And a second question, can I technically sell an NFT and later modify the metadata and change the image that someone owns? Well, you can't, you can't change the NFT as it exists because it's locked in by the smart contract. Unless you have control of the smart contract, you can't change the information on that NFT. If you're the owner um, of the smart contract, so the artist who created it in the first place, yes, you can make it so that it changes. And those are those metamorphic NFTs that I was talking about. Um, so you might have one that starts looking like a bunny rabbit that turns into a monkey, you know, for all I know. Um, but it, it depends on what the, what the smart contract is executed to do. And so it can execute all sorts of different code. And so it can change the look and feel of the NFT as it goes along, but you can't do it as a third party because you don't have control of the smart contract. Mm 